Good evening and thanks for coming. My name is Matthew Wright and I'm from uh, Beyond Zero Emissions and we're an a environmental organisation, a climate campaign, a group of volunteers, about 15 of us, who work on um, solutions to climate change. We've got a, a zero carbon team looking at each sector of the economy and uh, here you can see uh, the group that's looking after stationary energy, which is our, um, you know, our electricity for our, our lighting and our heating and things like that. So we've got a team for, for that sector and for transport and for land use and so on. Um, you can see there's a promo sheet for our radio show and we've had all sorts of excellent guests including uh, Amory Lovin, Tim Flannery, uh, we've had Dr David Mills from OSRA who's a solar expert from Australia, um, other solar experts and, and uh, various people of that sort of, uh, that sort of ilk. So here we've got, um, our plan is consistent with, uh, with Al Gore's Repower America campaign which is about transitioning the American economy to 100% clean electricity within 10 years. And uh, some quotes from him, it's, they want to go zero carbon electricity in 10 years and they want to end dependence on foreign oil. So when you bring those things together, that's 100% clean electricity within 10 years, which is for our computers and our lights and things like that, and also ending dependence on foreign oil, uh, you're really looking at a, a massive transformation of energy use to electrification and to renewable powered electrification. In fact, um, the US dependence on foreign oil is growing such that by 2020, they're looking at about 80% oil imports. So uh, that's a really a huge call. So certainly for what we're promoting for Australia, we say bring those two together and instead of just saying 100% clean electricity in 10 years when you want to repower Australia, we're talking about going 100% clean energy within 10 years. So let's just incorporate transport and electricity into the same core. So in order to sort of get an idea of how we do this, first we need to know about Australia's emissions in a global context. Australian emissions in 2006 looked like this. We had uh, stationary energy. That's the bulk of our emissions, and that's 55%, uh, and, uh, and that's from coal burning and gas, the use of gas. So we've got brown coal in Victoria, black coal in the other states, and, and uh, gas use. And some of the gas use there is um, reticulated to our houses and to industry. Another big sector is transport and agriculture. The, the transport sector obviously is driving around domestic aviation and things like that. Um, then we've got fugitive emissions. Fugitive emissions are related to coal mining, but also to distributing gas through the gas network. So we've got industrial processes. So if we're using petroleum in our vehicles, um, you can see the industrial process wedge. That includes the uh, processes that actually go towards refining that petroleum and being able to deliver that uh, to us so we can use them in our cars. But it also includes um, some things that we do in uh, metal making, in, in steel and aluminium and things like that. There's, there's emissions from those, those vectors. Uh, we've also got a wedge for waste and our, our, waste, our waste wedge is really about just losing methane from landfill and there's some opportunities there to flare that and create renewable energy. Uh, land use change in forestry, the government has its method, the Australian government has its method of accounting for that. There's some question marks around that because they use a really generalised benchmark for how much carbon is locked up in forest and soils. And, uh, and ANU's done some work there to prove that we've got a lot more carbon in our wet forests, for instance, in Victoria, than what, uh, than what you see there. Now, to give you an idea what's happened since 1990, when the Kyoto process uh, started and when they benchmarked against that year for, for the Kyoto Protocol, uh, Australia has seen a domestic rise in stationary energy and transport emissions. So that's been the predominant rise. And we actually got a target of 108%, while other countries, all aimed in the West, aimed for an average of 95% as their target. So ours was actually an increase. That was a concession that we pleaded for, claiming we were some special case and we shouldn't contribute that much to uh, the global efforts. And uh, we got our way on that, but we weren't content just to get our way on that. We also got a special concession for land use change in forestry, where land clearing permits in Queensland, uh, which had never actually come into effect, were revoked, and we were able to count that towards a saving in carbon. So it's something that happened on the books, but never happened in reality. So although we're likely to hit somewhere around 108% uh, increase on 1990 levels, which is a target that we bludgeoned the rest of the world into going with, um, and we only are able to achieve that because uh, we've got this special accounting in land use and otherwise we'd be at least about 4 to 8% higher than what we are now. So to give you an idea, um, we need to demystify some of the myths around energy 
And this graph is, looks quite complicated, but you'll see the really big blue bar in the middle, that's coal coming out of the ground. So this is from the Australian government. That's coal coming out of the ground and how much energy is contained in that. And you can see the bulk of that is actually heading along the graph and then down and is coming out as exports. So that's what goes out the coal terminals in the ships and to other countries. Um, the next bar that, that peels off that goes towards power stations and that's what hits power stations. But as you can see there, most of the energy then becomes the brown bar, which is losses at those power stations. So we heat up the Latrobe Valley and the Hunter Valley. Um, that's the predominant thing we do with coal, which is heat the atmosphere. And then the small pinstripe that peels away from those power stations there, um, that, that pinstripe actually shows you uh, what goes as an end use, what turns a light on, what powers a computer. So it's very little of the energy is delivered. And so that's why when you hear we're a coal state or a coal country, you really need to take stock of what's going on. There's a lot of coal energy, but not a lot of it getting used. So if we're talking about replacing our energy sector, we don't need to replace the bulk of energy on the left, which is what the International Energy Agency or ABARE like to report. We need to replace what's on the right of this chart, which is that small pinstripe of energy. Um, similar sort of effect in the other sectors. So some more information on that. So when the coal does arrive at the coal port and goes out of the country, the majority of it, um, by value, so by money that we earn for the country, goes out as metallurgical coal. So that's coal for steel making, and that's, that's where the real value is. That's the, that's the expensive stuff, and that's what's contributing to our current account. Um, as you can see, thermal coal is actually the third biggest. Thermal coal is what's steaming coal for running power plants. And uh, you know, that's like eight, $7 billion versus $17 billion based on the 2006 figures here. So as you can see, um, what, what happens with our coal? Well, there's this myth out there that the coal gets dug up and gets sent to China and uh, gets sent to China to burn in their power plants. Well, not the case, not the case at all. In fact, China is our, uh, our sixth biggest trading partner in, in coal and much, much smaller than our biggest. You can see there Japan. Japan is taking sort of an even amount of steel, coal for steel making and an even amount of coal for running power plants. Uh, if you go down to China, you'll find that the majority of what they're purchasing is for coking, very high grades of coal that are used for making certain kinds of steel, while the rest of their coal is domestically sourced. So as you can see, that's, that's a big myth that China's dependent on our coal. Um, here's another really important chart to look at. Now this is from Time magazine and they have a really good way of portraying things. And you can see here that total CO2 emissions since 1950, which is when the bulk of emissions occurred, uh, the, the US has contributed the biggest amount at 186 uh, billion tonnes of carbon dioxide and Australia's down here at 7.6 billion tonnes. You can see European Union at 127 billion tonnes. So that's accrued carbon dioxide to date. So that's everything since 1950 uh, to date and then booked against each of the countries who are the historical emitters. What's really interesting about that is India in 2001 was on 15.5 billion tonnes. And Australia was on 7.6 billion tonnes. Now, the, the real difference there is that India has a population of around a billion people and Australia has a population of 20 million. So to date, we've really accrued 380 tonnes of carbon dioxide each. That's our carbon debt. And uh, that's our per capita carbon debt. Whereas Indians have only really accrued 14 tonnes of carbon each. So there's a huge disparity there from developing countries. So when we go to point the finger at India, who haven't even you know, contributed an umpteenth of what we've contributed, uh, you, know, you really have to take stock of whether that's, that's equity in, in making that sort of call.